Good afternoon. Um, my name is Martin Munyao. I am um, a lecturer at uh, Daystar University in Nairobi, Kenya. I teach um, in two departments. I teach in the Department of Theology and Pastoral Studies, but I also occasionally do teach um, in the Department of Peace and International Studies, uh, especially on the related, um, uh, theologically related uh, courses regarding peace building. Um, and I'm so glad uh, to be invited on this uh, uh, Stott Bidiaco Forum um, to um, present a paper. And my paper this afternoon is entitled Whiteness in Christianity and Decoloniality of the African Experience, Developing a Political Theology for Shalom in Kenya. Now, um, historians have held that colonialism and Western missionary enterprise were two distinct and unrelated entries to pre-colonial Kenya. How then did Christianity for decades live side by side with colonialism? I contend that colonialism in Kenya could not have been positive without the missionary enterprise activity. The impact of that unholy relationship is felt and sustained in contemporary forms of violence. Land, for example, is a present source of conflict in Kenya. In the pre-colonial African ontology, the land was in harmony with the people. For the land to be taken away from its owners, a form of separation of the people from the land had to happen. And this was facilitated by, by a Christian theology that created existential dualism, violently separating the African bodies from their souls and the person from the community. Hence, Christian doctrine that emphasized saving souls and personal salvation was entrenched, deeply entrenched. This separation and fragmentation are fundamental to whiteness. Whiteness universalizes truth, even theology. It puts a face of neutrality that obscures specificity. Such has made the church uncritical of oppressive and unjust political structures. Whiteness realizes that it's hard to enter into something that is in harmony, something that is united, something that is one. Therefore, separation needs to happen for whiteness to succeed. Unfortunately, much of our theological understanding today is tampered with a neo-colonial mindset that separates the soul from the body for Christian triumphalism. It anesthetizes the pain of oppression with the eschatological promise of future deliverance. This paper will analyze the impact of whiteness in Kenya during and after colonialism to demonstrate how the British Explorer Settler Missionary Alliance oiled the religious and economic disenfranchising of African people. Secondly, it proposes a, politi a political theology that will restore shalom in a socially, economically, and spiritually broken country. It is such a theology done in Africa that will confront oppressive structures and identify with the marginalized communities in Kenya. <clears throat> so in opening, let me begin by introducing my paper by defining what whiteness is. What is whiteness? So whiteness does not necessarily carry racial connotations even though they are related. When talking about whiteness, the implication is not a white versus black or Latino or Asian racial identity. Rather, whiteness is a way of life that finds wings to thrive in the world through politics, economics, and Christianity. For every Christian in the world to end their Christian story is to find themselves in whiteness. Whiteness as a way of life positions itself as superior to other ways of life in domineering over other cultures. 
when it comes into contact with other cultures, it almost always wins. Therefore, whiteness in Christianity supposes a Christian supremacy over world cultures and religions. According to Jennings in his seminal work, The Christian Imagination, there is a particular moment in history when Christianity became white. He argues that this happened during colonialism where African people were subjugated. In agreement with Jennings, it is important to underscore that colonialism in Kenya was neither incidental nor adjacent to the Western missionary enterprise of the 19th and 20th centuries. Rather, the two were intricately linked. It is therefore incorrect to see mainstream Christianity today in Kenya as constrained by the external politicization of religion. In fact, during the colonial period in East Africa at large, the two were part and parcel of the same project. Christianity gave colonial agenda spiritual wings to succeed, while colonialism energized Christianity's expansionist movement and mission to the enriched people groups. The white missionary enterprise of Christianity in the 19th and 20th centuries uh, in foreign territories was an expansionist initiative of whiteness. And this expansionist attitude um, um, is, is whiteness in nature. It sought to explore, conquer, and convert new lands for God. As various missionary associations expanded, they penetrated and separated human societies abroad to subdue, uproot indigenous religions and societies and entrench a new faith. The new faith is what has now been inherited through various mainstream Christian denominations in Kenya and, and parts of Africa, which have an attachment to the missionary patrons in overseas. These have been called the missionary or mainstream churches. The mainstream churches in Kenya have thus inherited a white theology that is laced with colonial and capitalist baggage that is in, inextricably related or linked with the politics of the state. Therefore, even though mission churches in Kenya are independent of their Western counterpart in terms of leadership, whiteness continues to drive their theology and missions. This paper is not interested in invoking guilt on anyone or blame shifting. Rather, the paper seeks to ask the question of what do we do with what we have inherited? Let me start by um, analyzing that, by talking about whiteness and theology. It has been mentioned earlier in this paper that whenever whiteness comes into contact with any other culture, it always wins. Yes, whiteness interacts with other cultures. It alters their DNA, yet it is left and scathed by the cultures it comes into contact with. This reality has huge implications on Christian theology. James Jennings traces the theological foundations of colonialism, which at its core uh, was a form of evangelization. When missionaries came to Kenya, they placed themselves at the juncture of the known and the unknown. Kenyans in their respective uh, communities had an idea of God, albeit no concrete theology, to describe what they believed in. The African religious reality was real and alive, but whiteness by nature does a few things, or it did a few things. It, 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 not, all, it not always wins, but also universalizes and normalizes, yet leaving itself clocked in neutrality. Therefore, its theology is just theology. The rest of theologies are either Black, Latino, liberation, feminist, ETC theologies. By implication, white theology, which is not identified as white, is the universal standard. Whiteness becomes a norm with which other cultural identities are evaluated. This tendency to normalize whiteness 
has huge implications on both theology and global missions today. The mainstream churches have inherited a theology that is highly colonial and replete with Christian triumphalism. This means that the evangelical message, even though biblical, had to be fundamentally laced with whiteness. How has whiteness managed to be, uh, managed to be successful in doing this? For whiteness success to disenfranchise the Kenyan people, it had to be fragmental by nature. Remember I said earlier that it is hard to enter into something that is in harmony. So Kenyan societies are collectivistic. They are communal and closely attached to their land. There was an inseparable union between Kenyans and their land. It has always been like that. For colonialism to divide and conquer, to balkanize people in their ethnic identities, the evangelistic message had to precede colonialization and establishment of British protectorists. In obedience to the Great Commission that is stipulated in Matthew 28, 16, the church is to go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And the word there is ethne, for nations. Hence, the relationship between witness and ethnicity is of the utmost importance when considering mission. So the white missionaries had to approach Kenya's indigenous communities with a gospel theology that separates the body and the soul without the subjugation of various ethnicities in the colonial enterprise. So without that happening, this could not have been possible. The theology that accompanied the Great Commission was that of confession of sins, call to repentance, and salvation of souls, which are important to do. The implication of this separation of the body and soul, and the body and the land, will be discussed later. But for now, here's a look at that theology, at the sin and salvation doctrines which were entrenched in Western theology and replicated by missionaries in Kenya to this day. Let me start off with the sin doctrine. As mentioned earlier, the African communities are usually collectivistic with a group oriented view or approach to everything, including virtues. So being an honor shame context, Kenyans view sin differently from the Western worldview. Despite the growing prominence of honor in social theories and the emergence of Christian to Christianity in honor shame cultures, the notion of honor remains absent from theological discourse. In the Western worldview, sin is understood as breaking the law, breaking God's law, and something that people do. However, sin in the African context, in the African worldview, which is highly shame-based, is not a law that people break. It is actually who we are at the core of our being. It is not something that you do, but something that you are. In fact, in some African societies, sin is not a sin until one is caught. Therefore, from the onset, the missionary's explanation about sin was completely misplaced in the African context and worldview and ontology. Sin is breaking the law, as understood by Western missionaries was abstract and only appealed to one's guilt. For the missionaries to succeed in entrenching such a highly legal-oriented doctrine, they had to normalize a gospel presentation that emphasized on forgiveness of sin, the redemption of the souls, and the heaven-hell destiny that appealed on guilt and not on the shame of sin. But Kenyan societies are shame-based and their understanding of sin is different. Shame-based societies such as Kenya is are communal in terms of the setup. And because of communal dynamics, sin not only besmatches Adam's reputation, but also affronts God's honor. The most common expression of human sin 
is the construction of false status via religion or social codes. Such social engineering degrades others. It rejects the honor God graciously grants and upstages God as a true arbiter of honor. By definition, in the Kenyan context, sin is the integrated process by which our shameful behavior invokes shameful feelings, defaming one's character and status, hence dishonoring God. So Western missionaries coming from a heavily guilt-oriented background fail to recognize and understand the African worldview and instead imposed a, tr a truncated gospel that emphasized on the guilt of sinners and forgiveness of sins. When sin becomes what we do and not who we are, then that creates a discipleship deficiency on the new converts who come from shame-based cultures. Consequently, missionaries and their white settler counterparts could take Kenyan land and not be perceived as sinners. In that dichotomization of sin as not being who one is and reducing to what one does, consequently separated the soul from the body. This was even made worse in the articulation of the concept of salvation through the Western lens, which is what I'm going to talk about next, the doctrine of salvation. The Western missionary enterprise also articulated a salvation doctrine in terms of foreign, uh, in terms that were foreign to the recipient Kenyan cultures. Christian evangelists, teachers, and missionaries have focused on law, sin, and guilt, and proclaimed the need for repentance and forgiveness. These are important Christian teachings and should be taught. I'm not underscoring that fact. However, Nichols, critiquing his fellow missionary enterprise, lamented on the failure to, quote, stress salvation as honoring God, exposure of sin as shame, and the need for repentance and acceptance and the restoration of honor, end of quote. In, in honor-shame cultures, salvation is not necessarily understood through the legal, but rather a rego lens. Salvation is easily conceptualized as adhering to social expectations and respect for communally accepted standards without which one is shamed and cast out until they are restored or rather saved in the community. But the missionary's insistence and focus on salvation of souls led to the common rhetoric of counting of souls saved as a measure of mission success. So whenever missions was done, you'll hear a number of souls came to Christ. But where are the bodies? This separation and fragmentation of bodies and souls are fundamental to whiteness. And thus white missionaries needed to separate the soul of Africans from their bodies, hence a gospel that their souls will be saved. One needed to constantly uh, separate their life even when it didn't make sense. Salvation in the missionary enterprise efforts pushed and continues to perpetuate that idea that all that matters is your salvation. When this idea is repeated and normalized as that is what whiteness does and did and continues to do, it alters one's understanding about pain from oppressive structures, for example, by numbing the Christian oppressed with the promise of an eschatological utopian future as packaged in the Western missionary gospel's message. And such a gospel failed to address uh, the here and now of human existence in the Kenyan context and also failed to address African realities. Whiteness makes universal claims of what is needed. It claims um, a universal understanding of what is needed, what is beautiful, what is normal, and what is acceptable. And this means that there are uh, theologies 
or a theology that is acceptable, that is normal, that is universal and standard. Whiteness puts a face of neutrality that obscures specific theologies of other people. And that is why you find that even today in Sub-Saharan African Christianity, Christianity is surging more than anywhere else in the world, according to Jenkins. Yet Africa harbors some of the most corrupt countries in the world, according to the annual corruption indices. The relationship between the church and the state has allowed for corruption and oppression passing unchecked and sometimes in the name of God. Unfortunately, much of the Christianity in Kenya today is a supremacy movement for God. The theological understanding of mission still carries the colonial baggage of Christian triumphalism. And this ought to change as God has a special preference of the poor, the displaced, oppressed, and downtrodden as we see in the book of Luke chapter four. When people living in oppressive situations read the scriptures, they ought to find freedom in the world that Jesus lived in and freedom in their own world. Let me now talk about whiteness and land. The European settler farmers started arriving in Kenya as a colony for large-scale farming, a move that went hand in hand with land acquisition and the creation of white highlands. The unholy alliance between the white settler, the missionary, and the colonial government allowed for the loss of indigenously owned land by Kenyans to the colonial powers. The said unholy alliance was between European settler farmers and missionaries. For example, the Anglicans, Presbyterians, Protestants, we in particular in the 20th century Kenya, according to Gadogo. This empire missionary relationship oiled a revision of land policies, which allowed for massive white settler ownership of land while Kenyans were turned into squatters on their own land. For example, the commissioner of the protectorate was mandated by the Acquisition Act to appropriate a mile on either side of the railway for settler farms to attend to the seemingly idle land and eventually pay tax. Later, this act promulgated the East African Lands Order, which legally guided these land seizures that followed after the building of the railway from 1896 to 1901, according to Gadogo. Gross violations preceded, preceded of human rights you know, and ensued after such institutionalization of land injustices. According to Gadogo, some of the issues that dominated African politics from 1903 to 1952 when land alienation and squatter problems dominated the social discourses, included the low level of African wages, uh, and Kenyans were made to work on the white settler farms, such as Lord Delamaya, who owned and still does own huge chunks of land. Just how did Western missionary enterprise exist side by side with this kind of oppression? Missionaries, on the other hand, settled in the colonial Kenya in the early 1900s. And they, just like white settler farmers, needed land to settle down and build mission centers. They too were interested in the land in the guise of wanting to demonstrate holistic ministry through the building of schools, churches, and dispensaries. The Church of Scotland Mission, for example, CSM, um, used the British protectorate government in their bid to acquire land to the tune of 3,000 acres at Fogoto in the present day Kiambu County. Through the missionary establishment of education, which brought schools, evangelization, which built churches, and healthcare, which built hospitals, the Settler Missionary Alliance gradually believed in the adoption of the Western culture 
as a way of modernizing the indigenous Kenyans, a move that sought to uproot the African culture, memory, and land ownership. Hence, the infamous joke that when the missionaries came, they had the Bible, Africans had the land. They said, we close our eyes to pray. When they said, amen, the missionaries had the land, we had the Bible. As argued earlier, whiteness redefines realities and takes the pleasure of renaming sacred spaces. Therefore, driven by the expansionist empire notion, missionaries and explorers renamed the Kenyan land that they possessed. There is power in naming something. It denotes ownership and dominion. Remember when Adam was given the mandate to name all animals in the book of Genesis? He exerted authority and dominion over them just by ascribing them names. For the British Explorer Settler Missionary Alliance to do so, they needed to eradicate the name of the land that was there before. For example, John Henning Speak, a British explorer, renamed Kenyans and Uganda's largest lake in the eastern central Africa, Namloe, the body, which means the body of endless water, or Nlambulale, the home, the home of gods, the home of the gods, respectively, to Lake Victoria, after the Queen of England at the time. Also, Kenya's tallest and the most grandiose waterfall, the Thompson Falls on Ewasoniro River, was named by Joseph Thompson in 1883 after his father, Thompson. Those are just but few examples of the renaming of Kenya's sacred spaces. For creative power, the land was objectified and the naming of it concretizes. It became something to be renamed, subdued and controlled. That's what naming does. For one to do so, the land has to be separated from its past, its past ownership and significance. That is what whiteness through colonialism did. But the original owners of the land, the Kenyans who lived in it, had a different understanding about the land. The land is sacred, hence cannot be objectified. The land speaks, the land cries, the land is living. But whiteness came to separate the land from its indigenous ownership, a thing that allowed colonialists to confiscate it. Thus, control, trade, and commerce on the land required a separation from its people. It required the land to be displaced from its rightful ownership and the spirituality attached to it to the people. Such are the issues that need reform from a political theology perspective to decolonize the African experience in Kenya and redeem authentic Christianity that will become a resource for liberating and empowering the natives. How will this be done? I suggest one thing, a development of a political theology for Kenya. As had already been discussed in this paper, political and economic disenfranchisement of Africans by whiteness has incidentally led to the push and shove for the little resources, hence the widespread corruption, power struggle, sham elections, and at times civil war that characterizes politics in much of sub-Saharan Africa. While there may seem to be so much gloom in Africa, there is still some hope on the religious front. What the church needs are a political theology that reconciles the exponential growth of Christianity in the continent that I have talked about earlier and the African realities. That contradiction of the two Africas, whereby one of a political and economic disaster on the one hand, and on the other hand is that of a religiously flourishing 
continent makes the discussion on political theology more urgent. So the question of what the Christian church in Kenya can do to make the political history different is so pressing. This paper suggests two proposals. One is that of a radical detachment from the world of colonial politics. But secondly, is a righteous engagement in the world of present politics. Let me start by the first one, a radical detachment from the world of colonial politics. Now the church in Kenya must understand the history of the Western instituted church in Africa and should be in a position to critique it soberly. Such a critique must aim at distancing African Christianity from missionary Christianity. This calls for self-theologizing and self-propagation that is devoid of the power trappings of the Western church. True freedom to engage in political theology in Kenya must be cognizant of the fact that African Christianity seeks to understand Jesus lived out in the African realities where he is seen as the one who comes to set the captives free, lift the oppressed, and heal all of our diseases. The second part of my suggestion is that of a righteous engagement. While the church must radically separate herself from the dark and oppressive colonial history, it must also engage in the social and public sphere as an agent or agent for political transformation. A discussion of political theologies in Africa must be situated in the background of political imaginary that constantly features African realities such as poverty, civil unrest, tribalism, and corruption. Kenyan churches and their leadership must be ready to confront dysfunctional politics as well as oppressive structures that are remnants of the neo-colonial machination, machinations. With biblical prophets and Jesus Christ as models in both Old Testament and New Testament respectively, the church can redeem its prophetic ministry. And this calls the church to a righteous engagement in political action through three things, and I'll just mention them. One is deeper evangelization, which is very critical to the evangelical church body. Two is political advocacy, whereby we begin to engage politics that are development conscious. And thirdly, is development itself. Developing structures that have collapsed so that they can begin to see people and human beings for the enrichment of this country and the continent at large. As I conclude, it is unsettling to imagine how white evangelicalism uh, for example, has moved around the world and yet has not been touched or contaminated by the foreign contexts that it has passed through. How is it that white evangelicalism and its theology has not been impacted by blackness in Kenya? How is that even possible? Now, to reimagine Christian missions, there is need for missionaries to be impacted by the spaces that they seek to evangelize without necessarily needing to dominate them. And the attitude of current mission engagement in Kenya should be that of humility. What do I mean by humility? It is the acknowledging that no one knows everything and that it is okay not to have answers for every encounter. There is room for vulnerability in missions. Otherwise, a relapse to the mystics of the Western missionary enterprise will reoccur. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>